which is praise him, praise him, all ye little children, as our praise song. Let's stand as we are able. Smile at the person next to you. Smile at the person behind you. And smile at the pastor. All right. Take it away, ladies. <laughs> Praise Him, praise Him, all ye little children. Superseded by no power on earth. 
So if there's any question of what the founding fathers thought about this nation and the, how, what part God played in it, I think that ought to dispel it. But if not, here's a few from our, some of our more famous presidents, from George Washington, our first president. The smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. The third president, Thomas Jefferson, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Now that's a quote that we might say today. But it's interesting to see that even back in Thomas Jefferson's day, they were concerned about God's being God's justice and whether or not we deserve what we get what we deserve. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. I am profitably engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book upon reason that you can, and the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. And you'll see that. Uh, that these presidents come from, as they say today, from both sides of the aisle. Theodore Roosevelt, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. And he went on to say, it is necessary for the welfare of this nation that men's lives be based on the principles of the Bible. No man, educated or uneducated, can afford to be ignorant of the Bible. John F. Kennedy, our 35th president, the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. And my final presidential quote is from Ronald Reagan, our 40th president. Without God, there is no virtue because there is no prompting of the conscience. Without God, there is a coarsening of society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we'll, be, we'll become a nation gone under. So some of these aren't necessarily real bright views of, of our nation, but they do prove that our nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian values, and that our founding fathers, and that many of our presidents had a very strong faith in the God and our Creator. And I'll leave you with this one from Patrick Henry. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Henry. So as we celebrate this nation on the 4th of July tomorrow, and when you come across people that question, uh, is this a Christian nation or not, this nation was established with Christian values by Christian men not perfect men, but my count, there's only one man on this earth that was perfect. So they weren't perfect men, but they were men of God, and they were Christians, and they recognized that, and that was an important part of the founding of this country. With that, if you'd stand and greet each other with the right hand of fellowship this morning.
and around the world. We pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Today you'll find on page 447 in the hymnal. If you'd like to stand as you're able, please, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us. And Lord, as we assemble together this morning, we know that there are those that, from our congregation that are dealing with difficult situations. Father God, we lift to you uh, Vivian Hers, and we pray that as, um, as she is in the hospital, that you would be with her, that you bless and encourage her. We lift to you Leonard as well, and ask that you would encourage him. Lord God, we think of Joan McClintock and her family as she is mourning the loss of her sister. We lift her to you and uh, we lift the whole family to you, Lord, and just ask that your Holy Spirit would provide comfort and encouragement and peace. Father God, we pray also with Lorraine as uh, she's having a situation uh, involving her grandchildren, Lord. We lift that to you and pray that you would give peace and direction and that you would just surround her with your comfort. Lord, we do also pray for those that are away today traveling. Uh, we ask that your hand would be upon them, that you give them strength and encouragement and safety, 
and help them to know in, in their absence, um, we still are mindful of them. We pray too for Betty Bartley, who has been ill uh, for several weeks, Lord. Father, we pray for your strength and encouragement to ask that you would bless her. We pray for Phyllis Taylor as well, that you would be with her and give her strength and encouragement. We pray for the Nemnick family as they've lost Lloyd and ask that you give them strength. Again, we pray for the uh, family and friends of Kathy Haney, that you would watch over them and give them encouragement as they mourn her loss. And Lord, even though there are many sad things going on, we do also celebrate your working and we join with the Ferris family as they celebrated the arrival of little Lincoln uh, this past week. And Father, we just lift him to you and uh, pray for the whole family, mother, father, grandparents, um, that they would live lives that would demonstrate to Lincoln uh, who Christ is and what he has accomplished for us. Lord, again, we thank you for this day, this time, and we celebrate you, Jesus. And we pray that you would just help us to stay focused on you and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Those of you who were able to participate in Sunday school this morning were able to learn about our July mission emphasis, which is the Oblong Children's Christian Home in Oblong, Illinois. And this morning we are blessed to have Nancy and Arvin Modine. Nancy is a teacher of the high school at Oblong Children's Christian Home, and Arvin is the administrator. And as I shared, uh, with the people in Sunday school, Arvin is Velma Modine's son, and he is, this time we'll say, Bernadelle's nephew, and he is Linda Yarrow's cousin-in-law, and since you're all related to each other anyways here at Clay Center, he's probably related to you too some way as well. Arvin is going to come and share a message with us this morning. I encourage you to give him your attention, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. But do be praying how you can support uh, the Oblong Children's Christian Home. Um, he has more information about that if you are interested. But let's give our attention to Arvin, and would you please welcome him as he comes now to share. Children may be dismissed for children's church. I want to begin by just thanking this congregation. You were very, very good to my parents during their elderly years. You ministered to them, and I want to thank you. God bless you. I also want to thank you that you gave me a vote of confidence by supporting the ministry where I work. Uh, I didn't grow up in this church. I didn't grow up in the first few years of my life where uh, we're neighbors to Lloyd Lemnick, dear, dear soul. And uh, we moved down to Junction City. But this feels like my home congregation because we have no family in Junction City now. And this is home. And I want to thank you and God bless you. Uh, for those who were in the Sunday school class, this will be just a minute of review. Uh, but I wanted to uh, mention that there would be several people here who worked in the uh, Sunday school time. And just kind of give you a quick overview of the ministry that you support. Uh, and so you know the good that your, your dollars are doing. Uh, the mission statement of the Oblong Children's Christian Home is very important to us. Sometimes mission statements are, are made, they're stuck on a wall someplace, and they're forgotten. Every year we have been going back through our mission statement and evaluating our program to see, are we doing what we said we were going to do? So this is very important to us. Our mission is to glorify God by providing family-style homes for at-risk and struggling youth. The ministry disciples youth and their families by building healthy relationships. We're very much a relationship-oriented program. Demonstrating God's unconditional love. Teaching God's truth. 
and developing each child's unique ability. The ministry seeks to re reunite the family or prepare the young person for independent living. If you want one statement that summarizes our ministry, that's it. Our homes look like homes where family style, each one of our homes has a husband and wife who are house parents in that home. They recreate the family and they uh, help kids learn how to be husbands and wives and children. We've been blessed with long-term staff. I think this is even a little bit outdated. I think it's the, uh, all of our staff have now been with us at least 13 years, maybe 14 years. Uh, and uh, it's been a real blessing to have that long-term staff. We want every kid to know every day that he's loved. That's the very basis of our program. We want him to know he's loved by his house parents and loved by his God. The love alone is not enough. He must also know truth, God's truth. And we see everything that happens throughout the day as an opportunity to teach kids God's truth. We also try to develop each child's unique abilities. During our Sunday school time, we, we show pictures of kids and what their strength was. Every kid has a strength goal that we try to develop. Now we're going to deal with other goals, you know, anger management and uh, obeying the law and things like that. But as I mentioned this morning, maybe our most important goal is to develop a unique strength of each child. Our goal for two-thirds of our kids is to get them back home, reunite them with their family. Now there are, in that we're going to be working with the families too. We have what we call Family Development Weekend, one weekend a month when our families come to our campus and they get instruction. Uh, I say two thirds of our kids, there's another third of our kids that do to no fault of their own. And maybe not even the fault of the family, just the life situation they're in, home's never going to be ready for them. For those kids, we're going to see them through high school. We may be their home base as they go to college. We will launch them out in the independent living. Uh, Tristan, I, 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 li I like this picture. You notice the shirt he picked it from my side there. Uh, I like that. Uh, Tristan went, just went home last summer. He's in contact with us. His mother's in contact with us. Last letter mom sent was, when he graduates from high school, he wants to come back and be part of your staff. Sopa went, uh, spent uh, eight years at the children's home. She was one of our long-term residents, went to Lincoln Christian University, and last month she went to the mission field. Not in the faraway country, it's an inner city mission field uh, as a missionary to inner city to kids. We're in expansion, recent expansion program. We were able to build a, uh, God was able to, to build, I should say, uh, a school on campus for our high school kids. We've also, God provided through volunteers, uh, a uh, indoor riding arena for us, in which we work in therapeutic horsemanship with our kids. Been really a beneficial program for us. <coughs> Currently, we're expanding our program with a, an apprenticeship program, but also where a foundation was laid last week for a new Welcome Center office building. And then next year, Lord willing, and we we're confident in it that the Lord will bring us to pass. We'll go to another girl's home. We presently have two boys' homes, but just one girl's home. And it breaks my heart to turn away girls in need. Uh, so that's our mission. And I just want to thank you for supporting us. God bless you. Okay, if we go on to the, ne to the, next, uh, to the next slide presentation, if you would. And I'll get myself up here too. And we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh, how many of you want Clay Center First Baptist Church 
not only to survive, but to thrive. Let's see a show of hands. Yeah. Thomas Rainier wrote a book that you, many of you are familiar with in the church here. You've had it in your small groups. Uh, it was entitled, an interesting topic, An Autopsy of a Deceased Church. For any church who wants to thrive, this church, this book, has some good warnings for us. It's some helpful, helpful for us. Um, if you're not in a small group, I just kind of summarized that book in, in, in uh, kind of eight statements. He had more than that. But what Thomas Rainier did, he looked at uh, deceased church. Churches that had been thriving churches, but no longer existed, and asked what went wrong. And one of the things he found was the Great Commission became the Great Omission. There was a time in these churches where their, their whole view was, a uh, center part of their mission view was evangelism. But over time, just gradually, little by little, they slipped away. And they became self-centered, self-focused, rather than community and reaching out to others. Now, if you ask people, do you want people to join the church? Yeah. But they forgot that the, that the uh, uh, Great Commission to, uh, had a lot of action words, hard work words, go, baptize, teach. They also found that they were, people were more committed to methods than they were the Great Commission. Let me repeat that. They were more committed to evangelistic methods than they were the Great Commission. And over time, they continued to use outdated methods that no longer worked instead of focusing on how do we uh, do the Great Commission today. In southern Illinois, there's a uh, place that makes a steak sauce. And I talked with the uh, founder of that organization. He, one of the things he said, if we marketed our steak sauce the same way we did 20 years ago, we'd be out of business. And he had two bottles of steak sauce. One was the old-fashioned glass bottle, and the other one was the plastic bottle. And he explained that, that uh, putting it in a plastic bottle, not only did people like it better because if they dropped it, it didn't spider glass, but it, it dropped their shipping costs tremendously. But then he said, same sauce, different container. And that's what we need to do as a church. Same biblical-based message, but put it in containers for our 20th, first century colleagues. The church, uh, the second thing he found was the church clung to things that made them comfortable. Worship styles, times of worship, buildings. Instead of looking at what made non-Christians comfortable, not in message, but in methods, they, they clung to what made them comfortable. The church refused to have a heart for the changing community. The world changed, but they didn't have a heart for the new problems that came up in this world. As he, he studied the 20 years of these churches' budgets, and he said, if you follow the money, you can diagnose the disease. Uh, the budget turned inward. Whenever there was a financial shortfall, the first thing to go was community and world outreach. And the budget turned inward. And it wasn't a financial problem. It was a heart problem. And a church can no long, cannot long exist with a heart turned inward. It's true of a, of a children's home, too. Uh, that heart has to be there. Pastoral ten tenure decreased. Now, there were a few exceptions to that. There were a couple of exceptions where, where they had long-term tenure, 
but he made a terrible indictment. He said that in the long, people with long-term time tenure in a dying church tended to choose avoiding conflict over life in the church. In other words, with anything, when they tried to make changes to reach the community, and there was any conflict, they pulled back and chose the death of the church. Typically, a new minister would come, stay a few years. Uh, when they came, there, there would be a, an emphasis, a, a, a new hope. But as soon as the ministry began to make changes to reach the community, there was resistance. The minister became discouraged and left in these churches. Prayer became ritualistic routine and lack of passion. They quoted one person in there who said there was a time when prayer was central to all I did. There was prayer before the worship services, prayer meetings, prayer for many times. But then he got tears welled up in his eyes. And he said, then we began to make him prayer just routine. And then we begin to die. There are fights or physical facilities. Now, they weren't fighting over evangelistic methods. They were fighting over what color the carpet was. Some areas of church became more sacred than Christ himself. The church had no clear purpose. And this is a warning to a children's home too. In Indiana, there was the leading children's home, uh, and the, one of the leading children's home in the nation. I said was because it no longer exists. I asked the final administrator what happened. And he said we began to take state aid and when state aid came state rules, and we had to cut back on ministry, we had to hire non-Christians. Non uh, then the churches began to withdraw their support. The state decided they didn't want to support children's homes anymore, and they withdrew their support. And he said, we had a terrible financial crisis. But then he added, but Arvin, the real crisis was not financial. Along the way, we lost our ministry. And when we lost our ministry, God judged us and God closed us. Moving on, we're taking a hard right turn now the next slide here. This has been kind of negative, okay? But I want to look this morning at an antidote for the deceased church, for the church that would move that direction, particularly an antidote for the Great Commission becoming the Great Omission. It's what every Christian, next slide if you would, what every Christian member can do to create a growing church. Now I've looked at a number of different evangelistic ways, methods, and quite frankly, I've tried them, and many of them don't fit me. I think there are people who are particularly good looking, and not, and have particularly good social skills, who can walk up to a complete stranger and say, if you die tonight, would you be sure you want to heaven? And if you're one of those people who can do that, do it. But when I do that, people run. <laughs> Next slide, if you would. Uh, bless is God's plan from the very beginning. Back when he called Abraham, God said, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. The Jewish people knew that they were blessed by God. But they forgot 
that they were to be a blessing to others. God intends to bless our lives. God has blessed the children's home. God has blessed me. <coughs> God has blessed you. But he intends for you to be a blessing to others. I, the uh, basing this sermon on a on a uh, booklet uh, by Dave Ferguson, and it says five simple practices for changing the world. Now, while the practices are simple, <laughs> I found the implementation hard. I have a unique I'm in a unique position in that I get to make one sermon and practice it about 30 times as I go to different churches. And uh, I don't know how your minister come up with a fresh sermon every Sunday. I couldn't do that. But I decided about six months ago that I would preach this sermon, but I want to try it out first. And as I tried it out, I found it difficult. I found that I had to be really committed to two rates. The next slide there has that. The Great Commission, uh, or the Great Commandment, I should say, first of all, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Bless is not something you can just tack on to a selfish lifestyle. And the Lord's still working on me on that. But we've got to be committed to that great, and then the second great here, the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. You know the words. It isn't just an option. That's a command. Bless is actually an uh, acronym for the B stands for begin with prayer. That's where it starts. I am asking each one of you to begin each day by asking God to give you divine appointments. People you can bless. We see Christ constantly in prayer. The next slide. Uh, when he was choosing his disciples, he said, he said, in those days he went out to the mountain to pray, continued all night in prayer. When it was day, he called his disciples. You know, if, God, if Christ needed to be in prayer so that he could bless the world, how much more do we need to be in prayer? The second uh, stands for, the L stands for listen. We need to listen to people. In my office, I have a office manager who just, when people come, whether it's kids or staff members, they always want to share with her. And I wonder, I'm the administrator, I'm the one with a degree in counseling, why did they go to her first? I'm learning a great deal from her. She listens well and responds enthusiastically to what they have to say. And if we will listen to people, we will have an opportunity to bless them. We see Jesus listening to people. As he came near Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the road begging. Hearing a multitude going by, he asked what this meant. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He cried out, Jesus, you son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him, that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, You son of David, have mercy on me. Standing still. Jesus was not in such a hurry with the Jericho that he couldn't stop and listen to one blind man. Standing still, Jesus commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? He said, Lord, heal me, that I may see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. The next E in our best stands for eat the people. Now, I thought I could do that easy. I like to eat, as many of you know. 
But I'm a task-oriented person. And I found I had to make appointments to meet with people. I had to make time for that. We see Jesus often eating with people. There's something special about sharing a meal with somebody that opens the doors. Uh, we see in Matthew 9, 10 to 13, as he sat in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are healthy have no need for physician, but those who are sick. We need to make time for people. Uh, eating with people is just one way. Uh, I think it stands for a, a broad area. Too often, we as Christians get in our holy huddles. And that's all we do is go from one huddle to the next. Can you imagine a K-State football team who huddled up and went, went to the line of scrimmage? then called timeout and went back to the huddle up again. And then went back to the line of scrimmage and called timeout again and huddled up again. The fans would soon be yelling, boring. <laughs> and it wouldn't be long before the players would be yelling, boring. And the coaches would be saying, boring. We need our holy huddle. I'd encourage every one of you to be in, in a small group. I think that's the way we grow very often, is in small groups. But we need to go beyond our small groups and touch the lives of people. I am getting I'm one to three years away from retirement. And uh, Nancy and I decided to take money out of retirement and we needed to get, since we didn't have a lot of money for retirement, we needed to get to produce as much income as we could. So we began to buy a few rental houses. And my first thought was I wanted to rent the Christians. I thought they'd be better renters. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for us to touch hurting people. And I want to be the very best landlord but I want to be a lot more than that. I want to be their person who listens to them when they're hurting. We have to, who serves them when they're in need. And we've had some of our renters start attending church. Not real regularly yet. But every time there's a special church event, our renters are invited. And they come because they know we care about them. We have to have contact then with the unsaved. And that leads us into our next point, which is uh, serve people. And this, you see Jesus doing that. Uh, it says the Son of Man uh, came not to be served. You know, if anybody deserved to be served, it was Jesus. But he didn't come to serve. He came to serve others. When we serve people, we earn the right to share our faith. They begin to ask, what makes you different? What makes, how, do you, how come you love like you do? And then we get a chance to share our faith. When I first started this, the first person I began to serve was a, a lady who uh, was actually in our small group, but was rather limited, and uh, I began mowing her lawn. And it wasn't long before she would call and say, she wouldn't ask, can you come and mow my lawn? She'd come and say, when are you going to come and mow my lawn? And I was first kind of taken back by that. But then I realized it was good for me, because I wanted people to say what a good person I was. And God just wants me to serve people. And let Him have His glory. Let us serve those hurting people out there. And then the last S in bless is share your story. 
discipleship. Share what God's done for you. Share how God came to save the world. It doesn't have to be fancy words. Just share God's walk with you. And people will listen. St. Francis of Sissy said, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to count for the hope that's within you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. If you are praying for those divine appointments, if you are listening to people, if you're eating with people, if you're serving people, they're going to ask you about your faith. Be prepared to share it. Just in summary, I'm going to say the word be, and I'm going to ask you what it stands for, okay? For example, if I said be, you would say begin your prayer, okay? So we cut the first one down. The be, is what? Okay. The L? You should do other people. The E? Eat with people. The first S? Share with people. The second S? Share with people. Thank you. If you need this reference, I have an extra, extra copy with me. It's a free download on the, on the internet also. Um, I'd just like to conclude by saying, may God bless you as you, are, as you are a part of God's plan to bless the world. May First Baptist Church continue to be a blessing to the world until Christ returns. God bless you all. Jerry's going to come and lead us in a song of invitation, and then as he does that, we'll have you stand as we prepare for our time of communion. And as we do with, when we have communion, again, you don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church to participate. You don't have to be a Baptist. You have to be able to say in your heart that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we invite you to have communion with us following our time of invitation. But we appreciate so much um, Arvin sharing that message. Uh, one thing we as Baptists here in place that we like to eat, so that one's not going to be a problem for us. But keep those in mind. Use that acronym, BLESS. Because God wants to use us to bless our families, our community. All right? So let's stand as we have our hymn of invitation. <coughs>
seat. Mr. Wynn is going to offer our communion prayer. And Danny, if I could ask you, would you mind saying a prayer for Arvin and Nancy and their ministry? And Avlong as well. We'll say a prayer for them uh, before we have our prayer before communion. Sure. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we do lift up Arvin and Nancy. Father, we know that their ministry is very important to you, and that makes it very important to us. Father, we just uh, ask that you would continue to bless them, guide them in their endeavors um, as they seek your will in um, this ministry for children. Father, we know that you love them, and they love serving you. So we ask that you bless that special ministry. Father, as we come to you uh, this morning, to this communion table, uh, we come to remember, come to remember your broken body as we take the bread and the cup. But Lord, also we come to remember you and your love for us. We remember your patience, your kindness, your everlasting uh, omnipotence in this world. We remember your power and your glory. Father, we seek your face today as we come to this table we just ask that you find us worthy. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks. And then he broke it and he said that that bread represented his broken body. And we think about the different things that Jesus went through. The different ways that he suffered for us. And then we sit in our air-conditioned pews making sure that services are at convenient times, talking about activities that we can try to fit into our schedules. When we think about brokenness, we need to think about it in our own lives, breaking down the walls that we put up, setting aside those things that really aren't that important eternally. You know, the message this morning about being a blessing, you know. Think about all the things we could have done this past week, but we didn't have time to do it. All the people we could have blessed, but we had something better to do. All the ways we could have shared Jesus, but we just never found an opportunity. You know, sometimes my kids will say something to me and, um, they'll say, oh, well, I, I, I couldn't do it, or I didn't do it, or this, that, other thing. And, and I'll say, well, aren't we glad Jesus, when he was going to the cross, Jesus didn't say, oh, you know, i got something better I could do today. As we hold this tiny little piece of bread this morning, let us remember what it means, what it signifies. But then also, let's take it like it really matters, because it does. Let's remember what God calls us to do, and let's put him first in our lives, and put these people in our lives that we know that don't know Jesus, put them first, make them a priority, because they are. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember what you've done through Jesus. And we pray that as Jesus' body was broken for us, that we would allow you to, again, break our hearts for the people of this community. That we would take the time, we would make the time to be a blessing. Because people need the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
that supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said that that cup represented, his blood represented the covenant, the commitment, the promise that he would make to us. So this morning, remember, communion is supposed to be a time of celebration, right? It's a time of contemplation, but celebration. And I want you, as we, as we conclude this time of communion, to think about a promise that God has made to you. Maybe it's the promise of eternal life. That's a good one. Maybe it's the promise to never leave you or to forsake you. Maybe it's the promise of a comforter. Maybe it's the promise of guidance and direction or the promise of correction. You know, whatever it may be. Think about the promises that God has given to us. And let's celebrate them. You know, we have communion sometimes, and yes, we want to be contemplative. We want to, to be meaningful. But as we leave this place in just a few minutes, we ought to have a smile on our face. Because God, when he makes promises, he keeps them. So whatever promise he's made to you, whatever promise you're holding on to, whatever promise you need him to keep, let me assure you, he's going to do it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for your covenant, for your commitment. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you won't leave us, you won't forsake us, you won't let us go. We thank you that you have saved us, that you have sanctified us, that you glorify us. We thank you that you comfort us and guide us and direct us. We thank you that you call us and you send us. We thank you that you empower us. And Father, we thank you that you love us. We celebrate it this day as a family of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as you're able, if you'll stand and grab the hand of somebody next to you, we're going to just sing um, the chorus of that song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. But only sing it if you mean it. I'm so glad Again, we thank you for the message that you have given to us that Arvin has spoken. And we desire to be a people that will be a blessing to our community, to our family, to our nation, to anyone to whom you call us. Go with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.